According to legend, the first Chinese dynasty, the Xia, was founded by the survivors of a natural disaster shortly before 2000 BC. The Yellow River burst its banks and caused terrible floods for a number of years, leaving only a handful of survivors. Facing up to this deluge was one man, immediately designated as a providential leader, the founder of the first great oriental civilization, Yu the Great. For a long time, this fable enabled the Middle Kingdom authorities to legitimize their centralized power. The Xia were therefore the common ancestors of all the Chinese people, according to legend. But in 2001, archaeologists discovered the remains of a city ravaged by the floods in 2000 BC. The dates coincided. The discovery of the victims' bodies submerged in torrents of mud indicated that the legend was based on reality. A simple question therefore had to be posed. If the floods did in fact happen, would the Sia themselves not have existed too? In their pursuit of this legendary dynasty, historians would delve back to the very sources of Chinese civilization, rediscover the greatest of Neolithic cultures, and solve a mystery some 4,000 years old. To grasp the power of a nation, we often have to explore its history. China is no exception and has no end of fascinating secrets to reveal. For the first time, the Middle Kingdom is opening its doors for a journey back to the very roots of Chinese civilization. A journey through 2,000 years of antiquity, beyond legend, to the discovery of great dynasties, of incomparable works of art, and of flourishing civilizations that nevertheless died out and disappeared. A journey to the heart of an unknown and secretive China, a land of extraordinary colors, heir to a multitude of cultural influences. An odyssey to the sources of a great power born in antiquity. The history of modern China is still being written. Despite, or perhaps because of its cultural and linguistic diversity, China seeks to assert its unity. Even at elementary school, young pupils learn their lessons well. Uh, 或者说它代表了什么意思？华夏代表中，代表中国人。中国人就这，我们都是华夏一族孙后后代。华夏大子孙，华夏大子孙，华夏大子孙。The origin of the term Huaxia is unknown. The name Xia was that of the first line of sovereigns who had settled along the Yellow River Valley. At a time when China is increasingly imposing its dominion, this reference shows the authorities' determination to root itself in the country's ancient history. And yet, the existence of the Xia has never been proved. According to the records of the Grand Historian, written in the first century BC by Sima Qian, there were three successive royal dynasties based in the middle reaches of the Yellow River Valley. There were the Xia between 2000 and 1600 BC, the Shang between 1600 and 1050, and the Zhou between 1050 and 221 BC. For traditional historians, these three dynasties embodied the civilized world 
formed in the cradle of Chinese civilization along the Yellow River. Archaeological digs undertaken by the Chinese in the early 20th century confirmed the existence of the Shang and Zhou dynasties, notably due to the discovery of early bronzes. At around the same time, Westerners too were looking into the history of the Middle Kingdom. The Frenchman Edouard Chavan translated Sima Chen's Records of the Grand Historian. A Chinese collector and antique dealer, Mr. Lu began to familiarize Westerners with Chinese art. In 1920, he even built a pagoda in the middle of Paris. More and more French archaeologists became interested in China, particularly when excavations revealed a new treasure, the first examples of writing. Writing appeared in China around the middle of the 13th century BC, so towards the end of the Shang dynasty. For this period, we do have some written records that enable us in part to corroborate Sema Chen's chronicles concerning the Shang era. But on the other hand, before that period, for the whole first part of the Shang dynasty, we have no writing, and so we can only rely on archaeological remains. With no written proof, it is difficult to establish the existence of the Sia dynasty, a veritable missing link between the end of the Neolithic period and the following dynasties. Only the archaeological digs can help solve this mystery. All the excavation campaigns were interrupted in 1937. Occupied by the Japanese, a large part of the country was in the midst of a brutal war. Archaeology was not a priority. The sites lay dormant until the People's Republic was founded in 1949. Archaeology became a state affair and was now run with a Marxist ideology. Dig work resumed and revealed new cultures, sometimes quite far from the Yellow River. But the Chinese communists would, for a long time, remain skeptical about this diversity. They believe China should be one and that Chinese civilization developed only in the Central Plains before conquering its barbaric neighbors. In 1995, the government launched a vast project to scientifically establish the chronology of ancient China and to confirm the existence of the Xia dynasty. Proving the existence of the Xia dynasty, notably through archaeological digs and research, constitutes, in a sense, the materialization of the Chinese people's aspirations to know more about their roots. The project brings together eminent specialists in archaeology, botany, and astronomy, but it is not exempt from certain nationalist preconceptions. To find the Sia, it is necessary to go back to the original sources and discover the legends recounted by Sima Qian. A very long time ago, the land was submerged beneath great floods. Try as they might, the kings could not stem the flow of rivers running wild. The people were living in appalling conditions. One day, a young man was chosen to attempt to control the floods. He was called Yu. As he put the well-being of his people above all else, he tirelessly led his companions to every corner of the land to accomplish his mission and to try and stop the deluge of water. During this formidable battle, his young body grew weak, and he became like an old man. He could barely stand up any longer. But despite the pain, Yu continued his combat. Thirteen years went by. Finally, you managed to dominate the rivers. And once the land had dried out again, the people began to prosper. With his companion's support, Yu became king. He was the founder of the first dynasty, the Xia. Yu 
Yu the Great is the main character in numerous legends, still very much alive in many Chinese regions. The inhabitants of the village of Long Xixiang in the Sichuan province belong to one of China's 56 ethnic minorities, the Cheng. One of their shamanic dances has been passed down from one generation to the next since time immemorial. The dancers hop from one foot to the other. The step is supposed to repel evil spirits and to bring prosperity. The story goes that the choreography was created to pay homage to Yu the Great, whose legs became so weak as he battled against the torrential floods. We pass on the story of the Shia from one generation to the next. Since the dawn of time, Every year we offer our most sincere prayers, so that we are protected from disasters caused by floods. The veneration for Yu the Great goes far beyond the borders of Sichuan. Monumental statues of the Master of the Floods rise up throughout China, on islands in the middle of rivers, in parks, or at crossroads. They are all testament to the exploits of the founding father of the First Dynasty and enable the Chinese to forge durable links to the extraordinary figure of the guardian of their history. In the propaganda, Yu the Great is a reminder of their common ancestry, the Xia Dynasty. The scientists' mission was clear, to transform the legend into reality. Archaeological discoveries throughout the 20th century enabled several cultures from the end of the Neolithic period to be identified. Their development was closely linked to the great rivers that have shaped the Chinese landscape. The Huanghe, or Yellow River, and the Yangtze in the center of the country. It was in the Yangtze Delta that an original culture developed between 3400 and 2250 BC, the Liangchu, it was one of the most powerful of the times, as revealed in digs that began in 1936. This is the latest discovery in Langchu, the city ramparts. I'm standing in front of a very well-preserved part of it. As you can see, the layers of earth are clearly visible. These are the first ramparts that date back to the Liangchu culture that have been found in the Yangtze Delta. Over several years, the remains of this enormous construction, some 5,000 years old, have emerged from the ground. They demonstrate the power of a society from the New Stone Age. Professor Bin Liu is in charge of the excavation work. The northern wall is the best preserved of the four walls in the enclosure. These are the stone foundations. Detailed analysis of the ground and of these stones has revealed that they came from a mountain situated several kilometers from here. Four meters have been preserved, but we think the wall was much higher. By studying the type of construction, we've realized that it was built using traditional methods by hand. The outer wall measured almost seven kilometers. The town would have covered some 750 acres. The number of pottery pieces found on the site reveals the size of the local population and their daily activities. The inhabitants lived from agriculture, notably from rice growing, as indicates the presence of carbonized grains found during excavations. 
The Liangzhu culture developed between 3,400 and 2,300 before our modern era, a period that corresponded to the oldest Egyptian dynasties. And if we look at the size of it, the town certainly holds its own compared to Egyptian towns at the time. On the site, the archaeologists travel back in time. They have deciphered the flourishing town's past. One level has even provided some vital information. I'm on the level where the inhabitants of Liangzhu lived. During the final days of the town, floodwaters buried it all beneath mud and sand. This strata corresponds precisely to that event. The lighter sedimentary layer is made up of silt. It proves that several floods washed over the city. It is known today that there were significant climate changes between 3000 and 2000 BC. Temperatures dropped and rainfall levels increased dramatically. Flooding caused the city and its treasures to be swallowed up. In the graves of Liangzhu dignitaries, archaeologists have found Song, ritual cylinders made from jade, a semi-precious stone. The presence of these objects in graves tells the scientists a good deal about the wealth and power of the Liangzhu notables. The precise function of the Tsong is a mystery, but their rarity suggests the jade cylinders belonged only to an elite few. The decoration is similar to what can be seen on Shang Dynasty bronze vases a thousand years later. During prehistory, jade was first of all used decoratively. But then around 3000 BC, it began to be used by nobles during rituals as an emblem of their authority. The stone acquired a certain social standing aspect. It became a symbol of power, of piety, of the upper classes. Much later, eminent characters such as Confucius gave jade an even greater social significance. So during this process, from being a simple stone with a magnificent gleam, jade became an object of worship for the Chinese, an historic and political symbol. The inhabitants of the autonomous Xinjiang region in the extreme west of the vast Chinese Republic still dig into the mountains looking for the stone whose popularity and value have never waned. Since antiquity, these mines have supplied some of the finest jade to be found. The market is flourishing. On seller stalls, prices of the finest pieces have increased a hundred times over the past ten years. This is real Khotan jade. How much is that worth? It could be worth 6,000 euros. It's a profitable business if you can distinguish between a piece of jade and a simple pebble. At the end of the Neolithic era, this was the case. The locals developed and perfected distribution networks and techniques for sculpting the very hard gemstone. The Liangzhu culture embodied jade art at its height. 2000 years BC, a highly stratified society developed in the Yangtze Delta. Dignitaries controlled a vast territory 
and no doubt presided over religious ceremonies. But they could do nothing about natural disasters. In 2250 BC, the Liangzhu culture disappeared. And so it cannot be assimilated with the first dynasty. To find the Xia, we have to look elsewhere. First identified by archaeologists in 1928, the Longshan culture was based in northern China. Between 2500 and 1700 BC, it occupied the Yellow River Valley in a region the Chinese still regard as the original cradle of their civilization. The land that stretches as far as the eye can see is composed of loess, which has traveled far. It is wind-blown sediment from the deserts of Central Asia. In winter, peasants try to stabilize the soils. A civilization has never been so defined by the land which gave birth to it. A land whose fertility enabled millet to be grown, the main cereal in northern China. In recent years, important discoveries have been made at the Taozu site, the birthplace of the Longshan Neolithic culture. Nine large tombs have revealed significant grave goods. The dead were accompanied by colored pottery artifacts. Their remains were decorated with pieces of jade. Archaeologists have also unearthed some small bronze objects testifying to a burgeoning metal industry in ancient China. Excavations are still going on throughout the region. In the past 50 years, archaeologists have gathered tons of ceramics, including both rare pieces and ordinary everyday pottery objects. But their latest discovery was a major surprise for the scientific community. We were a little surprised. It was quite unexpected, or even unthinkable at that point, that such an ancient culture had accomplished something like that. What can we say apart from that it's really exceptional? In 2003, Professor New's teams dug up a strange structure some archaeologists consider it to be the oldest observatory in the world. It was built on the lower slope of a sacred mountain to the east, towards the rising sun. The architectural layout was composed of 14 pillars at least 4 meters high, aligned in a semicircle around a very carefully defined central axis. When the sun rose from behind the mountain, the light fanned out among the columns. The direction of the rays and shadows varied according to the date and the season. The structure was built according to the astronomical events that still determine our modern calendars, equinoxes and solstices. It is a solar observatory some 4,200 years old. Thanks to this calendar, the Longshan could determine the key periods in the farming year. Notably, the dates were sowing the cereal that was essential to their survival in this region, millet. The king was able to control his people by monopolizing all the information concerning the movements of heavenly bodies. If you didn't obey the king, he could refuse to tell you when to plant your seeds or to harvest your crops. So not only did he possess the means to starve the population, but he also had a way to save them and to keep them under his control. And yet, the latest excavations have revealed that this power was fragile. 
the nobles had to face up to violent rebellions. Archaeologists have found skeletons that had been thrown into rubbish heaps. Some of the victims had been tortured. The remains of a woman was found in a pit filled with cow and pig bones. Analysis of her teeth and bones has provided information about her diet. She appears to have belonged to one of the wealthier classes of the population, but this didn't stop her from being decapitated. Her attackers also stuck a cow horn into her abdomen. She was tortured before she was killed. The colony must have undergone a revolt. The people were able to rise up against their oppressors. They probably took their revenge on the aristocracy by massacring this noble woman, as well as other individuals of similar social status, and then throwing their bodies into piles of waste. After the third millennium BC, Several ethnic groups which had developed along the Yellow River Valley and the Yangtze established contact. These exchanges brought about technical improvements and cultural changes. But neither the Longshan culture nor the Liangzhu culture can be assimilated with the legendary Xia dynasty. In 1958, the remains of a new culture were found in early Do in Henan province. Could this be the key? Two dig campaigns in 1973 and 1983 revealed a number of discoveries. A short distance away from the present village and the river, archaeologists found the remains of some imposing edifices made of wood and packed earth. They were palaces. The scale of the remains is unusual. Neolithic cultures did not have such vast residences, and the best was yet to come. Move, move, out of the way. Be careful. Take it easy there. Leave it to me. It's all right, don't worry. A multitude of small pieces of turquoise form a strange figure. It's a dragon. One of the key symbols in Chinese culture. This legendary animal embodied the authority of Chinese emperors up until the early 20th century. Modern-day Chinese still worship this allegorical image of power. The dragon in early Do is the earliest example to have been found. Archaeologists haven't been able to identify the function of this bronze plaque studded with turquoise representing the face of a monster with globulous eyes. It was placed on a corpse's chest next to a small bronze bell. The same alloy was used to make one of the most important pieces found in early To, a short tripod vessel, a jue. Around 2000 BC, a number of bronze objects were produced. In China, the early Tou culture wasn't the first to smelt bronze. In fact, at the end of the third millennium BC, there were a certain number of cultures which are regarded as Neolithic, but which produced bronze objects. We have only a few such objects, and they're generally small. And the difference we can see with the early Tou culture is that in early Tou, they moved onto another level in the production of bronze. And in particular, they started to make vases. Vases. 
This object is testimony to the early Tou culture's level of sophistication. But was this city the capital of the Sia dynasty? One study demonstrates the power of the lords who ruled over early Tou. Professor Irao Yoshimitsu has traced the origin of the copper ore used with tin to make the bronze alloy. The copper always contains small proportions of lead, with quantities varying according to the place it was extracted. Even 4,000 years later, Analysis enables the provenance of the copper ore to be accurately determined. The study shows which sites provided the ore for the early Tou smithies. The furthest mine was situated in the Liaoning province, more than a thousand kilometers from early Tou. An analysis of the lead could reveal whether early Tou only had regional power, or if, on the contrary, the city possessed the power attributed to a dynasty, such as the Sia, with influence over a much vaster area. The fact that they brought in the lead from far away, even from the Bohai Gulf on the Yellow Sea, shows that this people had been able to establish a system of alliances with other peoples. The influence and power of the early Tou culture appears to have extended well beyond the city walls. And yet, one question remains unanswered. How was the early Tou site able to prosper, whereas other cultures in the late Neolithic era succumbed to natural disasters? An environmental study campaign has been launched to answer this very question. Scientists carry out core sampling tests to examine the soil at depths between one and three meters. They are looking for the residue of seeds some 4,000 years old. The results of their analysis are surprising. They find two principal varieties of millet. One is called foxtail due to its characteristic panicle. Both types have been grown here for a long time, but that's not all. Samples contain wheat seeds, generally found further to the northwest in the upper Yellow River Valley, as well as soybean seeds selected from a wild variety. Finally, the scientists are surprised to find rice seeds introduced to early Tou from the Yangtze Delta, much further south. In most agricultural areas, the population tends to grow a single cereal, but the inhabitants of this region grow no fewer than five. A polyculture that perhaps made a difference. For example, if a region is affected by a period of drought, the peasants have foxtail millet, which can put up with such conditions perfectly well. If the land is flooded by persistent rains, they can plant rice. They always have something to harvest. They're safe from all natural disasters. Only a society with a highly advanced agricultural system can resist climate change. Peasants in the village of Arlito still plant the five seeds used by their ancestors. The land is exploited through a crop rotation system. Every summer, certain wheat fields are flooded after the harvest to plant rice. Others are planted with soybean seeds. In both cases, the wheat stems stay in the soil to fertilize it. Thanks to such methods, the Neolithic city was able to develop into one of the biggest urban areas of its time. But what did the town look like? The discovery of certain building foundations and ground surveys have enabled a reconstruction using CGI. 
The whole town is much more structured than one might have imagined. Peasant shacks generally covered an area of only about seven square meters. They form a village on the edge of the urban area. Not far away are buildings surrounded by fences. These were the workshops where specialists smelted the bronze. Unlike previous cultures, production in Erlito was on an extensive scale. To the east, a zone with the houses of the nobility. In the center, palaces and a temple dedicated to the ancestors of the royal line. The ensemble was surrounded by colonnades and an outer wall. It was a town's political and administrative center reserved for the king, priests, and the aristocracy. Archaeologists estimate that the town had a population of around 20,000, at the time, one of the biggest in the world. The architecture in China then was made of wood and packed earth. For this reason, the constructions are generally not well preserved but we can find traces of them in the ground. The buildings were on terraces of compacted earth in which they stuck wooden posts to support the roof. The loess, the fine sediment imported from Central Asia by the wind, constitutes the basic material along with wood used in Chinese construction. The peasants' houses, the king's palaces, and the first fortified walls were all made using loess, sometimes mixed with clay. Packed and compressed, the fine particles form a mass as solid as stone. Even today, farmers in the north of China use the same method to build walls around their fields. Packed down within a wooden frame, the loess dries and hardens, acquiring the same qualities as brick. For the scientific team leader, Professor Su, the layout of the city provides valuable information about the political system that oversaw its day-to-day -day organization. This is where the main palace was. The archaeologist notes that the building has certain architectural characteristics that were unknown among other cultures during the Neolithic era. The palace city was an enclosed area with a strict hierarchy. The entrance is via a gate to the south. The inner courtyard is surrounded by a covered gallery. A huge building dominates the esplanade. For Professor Su, the magnificence of the construction reflects the political power of the monarchs who live there. Could they have been the Sia that Sima Qian mentions in his chronicles? From an archaeological point of view, it seems obvious that Erlito was the capital of the oldest Chinese dynasty. You could say that it was China's first real heart. A good number of experts are convinced that it was the capital of the Xia dynasty that we read about. For them, Erlito means the Xia. Professor Su believes that the plan and layout of the royal residence in Erlito could have influenced all the palaces built later. He wants to check out his theory by visiting Japan. It's the first time that scientists from Japan and China have worked together on the subject. The meeting takes place at Kyoto University. Professor Okamura is an expert on late Neolithic cultures, and particularly the early Tō culture. The two experts have examined the similarities between the main palace, the foundations of which have been found in early Tō, and palaces from subsequent dynasties. There's a covered gallery all the way around, is that right? That's right. This design 
integrating a covered gallery is really very similar to the type of construction we see in certain palaces later on in Chinese history. There's really no difference with the plan that was still used in China up to the 20th century. A more thorough study of the early Tou plans reveals that they served as the basis for every later construction. An aerial view of the Forbidden City, built for the Ming Dynasty emperors, confirms the hypothesis. The main palace is part of a walled enclosure with the doors opening to the south. The plan of the building itself is similar to that in early Tou. A vast covered gallery surrounds the building, whose facade looks over an esplanade where the emperor would walk. The inhabitants of early Tou, therefore, invented an architectural form that would last for 4,000 years. We have a very good example in early Tou of the principle of a building which is organized around different inner courtyards. And so this is something we can see today. And the most famous example is no doubt the Forbidden City. But it should also be said that this is the traditional design for houses in the Peking area. The houses were also built and organized around inner courtyards. So the techniques evolved and materials were used later that weren't present in early Tou. But the principles behind this organization can be found at the early Tou site. There are no texts claiming that the inhabitants of early Tou were the Sia that the ancient historians talked about, but they clearly belonged to a culture that was much more powerful than any of its predecessors. The early Tou peasants developed a prosperous agricultural system. The metal workers imported ore from distant regions to produce sophisticated bronze objects. They transformed Chinese metallurgy into a specialized and highly codified art. In early Tou, bronze already played an essential role in the expression of power and authority. What we can see quite clearly is the link between the production of bronze and the importance that rights could have in early Tou, in particular for the elite, because we have to remember that for a significant part of antiquity, bronze was above all linked with the elite. And this is very important. The production of bronze in early Tou was mainly reserved for making bronze vases for use in a ritual context. Certain archaeologists even think that the lords of early Tou could have invented the court rituals. But what could they have been like? Until the early 20th century, grand ceremonies enabled emperors to reinforce their links with their vassals. By studying them, Archaeologists have imagined how ceremonies in the palace in early Tou may have taken place. dawn, nobles and certain chiefs from surrounding villages are allowed to enter the palace grounds. They are no doubt carrying a number of offerings. And so, as the faithful wait gather together on the esplanade, the king himself only appears at the last moment. In his hand, he has a Jang blade, a tablet sculpted from the purest jade. The Jang blades were sacred objects that the inhabitants of early Tou probably borrowed from the mountain peoples in the western regions. 
By adopting these symbols of devotion from other regions, the kings would have reinforced their personal authority. Still facing the participants, the king suddenly raises up an object that glistens like gold. It is a libation cup, a jouet, a vessel whose shapes and forms have inspired other cultures. Finally, a handful of aristocrats join the king on the platform. It is time to share the alcohol made from local cereals. This exchange marks the hierarchy established in Erlito society. It symbolizes the social and political framework that presides over the population of the town. I think the Xia dynasty put a certain emphasis on the relations between people. Fundamentally, I think divine power had less influence than the power of the sovereign. Obviously, rituals took place to reinforce spirituality, but instead of revering deities, the faithful honored their ancestors. This means that the Xia dynasty concerned itself more with men than with gods. Each spectator at the ceremony is aware of the sovereign's superiority, of his status at the summit of all worldly things. The ritual also seems destined to strengthen the relations among the members of the community. Early Toe culture spread over an extremely vast area. But I'm convinced that it wasn't the result of military domination, but of a more gentle culture. In fact, of a cultural power. In essence, the capital of the Xia dynasty, Elito, was the first cultural center in the Far East. The Chinese still visit the temple in the town of Kaifeng to pay homage to Yu the Great. Legendary images blend into historical reality. Beyond the myth, Yu the Great represents the founding father of modern China. But with no written testimony, it's hard to say if the early Tou culture can be assimilated with the Xia dynasty. One thing is certain. This culture is a missing link between the late Neolithic societies and the Shang and Zhou dynasties. Two thousand years before our modern era, the kings of Erlito invented a system of government and established a theory of authority and religion. Their power was materialized through bronze objects that became a mode of expression for the elite. The early Tou culture announced the emergence of civilization. Towards 1600 BC, the Shang Dynasty established itself along the Yellow River. It would take the art of bronzeworking to its height and develop writing used in divinatory rites. In 1045 BC, the Zhou replaced the Shang. They forged alliances with their neighbors and set up a feudal system. Obviously, at this time, China was not yet called China. But the unification process was underway. Within the cradle of the Central Plains, on the banks of the Yellow River and the Yangtze, all the ingredients were brought together. The history of a future great power could begin.